Some of my favorite videos on this channel have focused on the writing and design behind my favorite series. And as such, this will be the first in a new series of videos called How to Write Anime. Now, in this video specifically, we're going to be talking about how three of the greatest anime of all time, being Yoshihiro Togashi's Hunter x Hunter, Eiichiro Oda's One Piece, and Hirohiko Araki's Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Each of these is fairly long-running, but as you watch them, they are constantly interesting and you always want to see more. There's that old meme that One Piece seems like a very long series for someone who hasn't watched it, but once you start watching it, the idea of it ending is horrible. These shows all have something amazing in how their arcs are set up, and as such, today we're going to be exploring how to structure anime. Before we get into it though, if you're enjoying this video and you want to see more writing analysis in anime, then leave a like and subscribe for more in the future. There will probably be spoilers ahead, so be a little bit careful if you're not caught up on these series. But with the YouTube stuff out of the way, let's talk about Hunter x Hunter. The Hunter x Hunter anime follows the story of Gon on his journey to find his father. To do this, he needs to become a hunter, someone in this world who is licensed to travel freely, access secret documents, and essentially do whatever he wants to some degree. Through this adventure, he meets three people who become his friends, an ex-assassin named Killua, a boy looking to avenge his clan, Kurapika, and Leorio, who's just kinda a cool dude that wants to be a doctor. On its surface, Hunter x Hunter is a very generic shonen. You have a young boy with a goal, who meets a bunch of friends and they form a group, and together they need to travel the world and become stronger to make his dreams a reality. And in many ways, it's just a very polished version of that. But let's be real, is just being polished enough to make it this icon of a series that it's become? Why is this anime so beloved when in reality, a lot of it's kinda basic? Gon is a pretty okay character, but until the Chimera Ant arc, he doesn't really do anything special. The supporting characters like Hilua and Kurapika are great, but Kurapika isn't present for more than half the series, and Hilua is more of a reactionary force that clings on to Gon than anything else most of the time. On the other hand, it does a lot of stuff really well. Antagonists like Hisoka, Krolo, and Meruem are fantastic, and the power system Nen is top tier. But I think that Hunter x Hunter has a factor that is baked into the structure of its story that goes beyond those obvious features like characters, and keeps people invested and feeling like the show is fresh as they're watching through it. And that is that this series is an emotional roller coaster. Now, this isn't to say that it's crazy and all over the place, however, every arc does have a completely opposite dominant vibe to the previous. And this flip-flopping between happy and sad, or exciting and scary when combined with the fact that they are constantly visiting new locations keeps you from really feeling like you're ever stuck in one spot for very long. Even if Gon isn't really making progress to finding his dad at any given time, you personally feel like the story is progressing and evolving. And this obviously isn't to say that Hunter x Hunter doesn't have a lot else going for it, but we're going to be focusing on the story structure today. And to see what I mean, let's take a look at the arcs. We start things off with the Hunter exam. This arc brings us into the series, and while there are definitely a few darker elements in here, you know, murder clowns and whatnot, the overall vibe of the arc is overwhelmingly fun and light. You have this really cheerful music, silly missions like a very far walk, or just cooking. And you meet all of Gon's new friends, you see him leaving Whale Island for the first time and just experiencing the world in a new way. Everything is fresh, fun, and it really just feels like a battle royale tournament arc with events rather than just fighting. It's a great time, even if there are murder clowns. From here, we go to the Zoldic arc. Yes, I know it's not a full arc, but it is a drastic change of pace that doesn't really fit into the surrounding sections, so the idea is still there. And more importantly, it's my video and, you know, it supports my argument, so I'm going to talk about it. In the Zoldic arc, we meet Killua's assassin family. We learn about him being tortured, about his insane mother, just all the dark goings-on around his family. It's a short arc, but it's a decidedly big change. And it also brings in another big decision for the series that I definitely didn't see coming my first time watching, especially for a shonen where we just met our group. At the end of the Zoldic arc, both Kurapika and Leorio leave the group to pursue their own goals. Something which, even if it is good in the long run, is kind of a downer. 
Heaven's Arena again, tournament arc. Gon and Killua learn the basics of Nen from Wing, and they climb a massive fighting tower that ends with a match between Gon and Hisoka, where Gon lands a big hit. And it's this whole section about growth and triumph. It's a good time. Followed by York New City. A dark dive into the spider's den. Karapika returns and is working for the Mafia to get closer to the people who killed his clan. We see him murder Uvogin, and we have this iconic red eye moment. We meet the Phantom Troop properly. We see their massacre at the auction house, Krolo's Symphony. There is a lot going on, but not much of it is very happy. It's just a ton of tension. Then we get isekai onto Greed Island, where we continue to learn about Nen from Biscuit, play a video game, collect some cards, and I cannot stress this enough, it climaxes in a dodgeball game. This is followed by the Chimera Ant arc, where we meet Kite, who is Gon's biggest hope of finding his dad, and he is swiftly beheaded by Pito. We meet Meruem, this Chimera Ant King, who is the sign of the end of humanity's reign over the Earth. The whole arc is just brutal and dark, ending with Netero, one of the strongest characters we've ever seen, dying by blowing himself up in a nuclear bomb just to poison Meruem, not even really killing him immediately. Meanwhile, Gon is losing himself, literally giving up his Nen and childish naivety for the opportunity to get revenge for Kite, brutally and savagely killing Pito as a result. And then there's this goofy election arc with animal people. This kind of up and down makes every new arc that comes into play feel like a drastic change that hits just right for making the series always feel full of life and new. And I think that writing your story in a way that has sections with hugely different emotions and payoffs associated with them is a powerful way to make each part distinct and impactful. And yes, an important thing to note here is that none of these arcs are solely one thing. The Hunter exam has Hisoka and Illumi in the middle of this bright, fun section. One of the biggest trends throughout the themes of Hunter x Hunter is that nothing is ever really pure good or pure bad, and this is perfectly demonstrated in the arc structure themselves. As the arc trends towards positivity, we will always have notes of negativity, and vice versa. One Piece also uses the structuring of its arcs in a very effective way to keep people interested. However, rather than swapping between emotional highs and lows every arc, each arc individually demonstrates that kind of thing in the same way. We already kind of talked about why this is effective though, so let's look at another way that Oda creates his arcs. And that's by reincorporating the themes in one arc and subverting them in the future. A great way to build on the content you've already presented, as well as expanding on the world and characters that make up your story. Oftentimes, as the story progresses, we'll get to see a completely parallel or mirrored version of the experiences we had earlier on. The example I'm going to be talking about here is Arlong Park versus Sabaody or Fishman Island. Obviously, there are other examples, but I think this is probably the most easy and clear one to talk about. Arlong Park revolves around Nami returning to Kokoyashi Village, where the Fishman Arlong has taken over years prior. We learn that Nami had essentially been kidnapped by Arlong when she was a child after killing her adopted mother, and she is now trying to collect a hundred million berries to buy back her village. However, once she is nearly finished, Arlong betrays her and sends the marines to steal all the money she saved. This arc is all about this terrible and imposing force of the Fishmen. They're treating people like animals, or even worse, and we see them justifying this by saying their species is superior, so they have the right to rule. It is a pretty straightforward allegory for racism in our world, along with the idea of racial supremacy. It sows a whole level of hatred and fear of Fishmen into Nami as well, and we see this bubbling to the surface as she becomes more and more nervous as we get closer to the idea of visiting Fishman Island. However, the journey to Fishman Island is a long one, and along the way we have to get to Sabaody. And on the way to Sabaody, the crew comes across Kami and Papagoo, two people who are from Fishman Island. More importantly though, they are friends with Hachi, one of Arlong's henchmen. However, once she learns about how Hachi is trying to reform and become better, and that he has saved Kami countless times, Nami decides that helping Hachi is something that needs to happen. A pretty strong sentiment to act on, since Hachi was one of the people who had tormented her for so long. 
Then, once we reach Sabaody, Kami is captured and being sold at the auction house, and the money-loving Nami does the unthinkable when she offers to spend every penny that she has to buy Kami's freedom. This whole section was a great way to show that not all fishmen are terrible, which is very unlike the representation we had in Arlong Park. And it doubles to show Nami's growth in recognizing that. Then we finally get to Fishman Island where we learn that the reason Arlong hated humans so much was because humans, as a whole, treat fishmen like monsters, often killing them or selling them into slavery when they go to the surface. And all of this coming to a climax when she meets Jinbe. He tells her the story of Fisher Tiger and Otohime, and how the hopes for peace between fishmen and humanity were devastatingly destroyed. He then explains how he was personally responsible for Arlong's release from prison, and through that thread, ultimately enabled him to go to the East Blue and attack Kokoyashi Village. Jinbei then says that he wants to take full responsibility, and Sanji immediately gets up telling him to end his own life. Which Jinbei is totally willing to do, but Nami stops him, saying that Arlong was the one that she hated, and Jinbei obviously meant well in what he was doing. She doesn't hate him for being a fishman, nor does she blame him for Arlong. Yes, she went through something terrible, but that ultimately brought her the happiness of being a straw hat and all the adventures that came with it. So, all she asks for is that he not apologize for the life that she now appreciates. The reintroduction of themes tied to arcs and their core characters has always been one of One Piece's greatest strengths. Not only does structuring a story around these pillars create a phenomenal sense of world building by presenting multiple perspectives, but it also acts as both a catalyst and measurement for character growth. There are a lot of parallel arcs that similarly function to this, and it's incredibly effective in keeping people interested as it both ties you into the world and into its characters. Now, the last series that I want to talk about in terms of structure is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This series is drastically different from the last two. When it comes to Hunter x Hunter, we talked about how emotions can be used to structure a story, One Piece had the use of parallel arcs as a framework, and then we have JoJo's, which fittingly is kind of bizarre. <laughs> If you're familiar with JoJo's at all, you probably know that rather than being one long-running series that continues fluidly, we instead have stories of the Joestar family that is told in several parts by jumping between different times, places, and even genres to some extent. This, by all rights, is an insane decision for a writer to make, but it actually plays into the series very well. Because JoJo's is such a uniquely strange series, it's also one that's meant to be fast-paced and fun in a way that constantly gives viewers something they haven't seen before, and this is supplemented by drastically changing the setting. Part 1 starts in England during the 1880s when a thief named Dario Brando fools the rich George Joestar into thinking that he saved his life, and upon Dario's death, he asks George to adopt his son Dio to repay his debt. Dio becomes an adopted brother of Jonathan, and essentially they grow up as rivals. However, Dio eventually finds and wears the stone mask, becoming an immortal vampire, and forcing Jonathan to learn Hamon to take down his adopted brother and save the world. This doesn't exactly go as planned, though, as Dio survives and goes on to behead Jonathan before stealing his body. Part 2 takes place around the early stages of World War II and sees Jonathan's grandson Joseph, who was living in America, traveling the world to take on the Pillar Men, essentially the ancient people who created Dio's mask. Part 3 begins in 1980s Japan with Jotaro Kujo, who is Joseph's grandson, and this part introduces Stans, mostly leaving behind Hamon. Stans are effectively a manifestation of a person's spirit in some form or another, and when Dio comes back into the picture, Jotaro's mother's Stan goes wild. To save his mother, Jotaro decides to head to Egypt in an Around the World in 80 Days style series to defeat Dio. Part 4 takes place in the Japanese town of Morio in 1999, following Josuke, again Joseph's grandson from an out-of-marriage affair. However, this one focuses on a more mystery element, as strange events take place around the town of Morio. Most of these are happening because someone has attained an arrow that awakens people's stands, and those tend to cause some level of chaos. But there is also a serial killer named Kira in Morio, and Josuke has to find this killer before it's too late. Part 5 makes a change and follows Dio's son, Giorno Giovanna, in 2001 Italy. Giorno is trying to infiltrate a mafia to reform it from the inside and bring peace to Italy. Part 6 is going to follow Jolene Cujo, who is wrongfully arrested in America. 
and part 7 we will start a whole other universe. Whereas Oda wanted to make a series that always felt familiar and like a home for people watching it, Araki seemed to have wanted to make a story that had elements from the past be relevant in a world that was insanely different every time. Of the five parts that we've had animated so far, we have four different countries acting as starting points, not including all the places they visit or the timeframes of the events. Constantly changing the settings, styles of the story, characters, villains, and so much more Araki seems to specialize in structured chaos, and it often feels like the good version of not being able to look away from a car crash. Each of these mangaka use unique ways of structuring their story to pull off very different effects, but all of them are incredibly interesting and pull audiences in in a way which never stops making you want to see more. Sure, there are some arcs which might not be perfect in there, and that can definitely cause them to feel a bit slow for a short period, but overall, it's safe to say that when you watch these, you want to see more. There's a reason that people always want more One Piece despite there being almost a thousand episodes. There's a reason that people are dying for more Hunter x Hunter anime. And there's a reason that when a new JoJo's part is announced, everyone who has seen the series gets incredibly hyped. These stories always feel fresh, and knowing how to do that is a powerful tool for authors to have. But that's where we're going to end this look at manga and anime writing styles. If you enjoyed and want to see more videos like this, remember to leave a like and subscribe to let me know. You can also leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. Finally, if you want to support the channel a little bit extra, you can check out my merch or my Patreon through the links in the description. And as always, I want to thank all of our fantastic people over on Patreon supporting the channel, with our Dai Yokai, Iffy Babes, Aikerochu, and Jacob Wiley, our Yokai, Amelia Hellman, Jadice Not Janice, and Joker Rose, and our Hanyo, Anthony Hogan, Kiwi Dog, Love the Kiwi, Michael Greco, Naga Kitty, Savage Camel, Simon Electric, Suki Neko, and Ziv. Thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, remember to stay excellent. <laughs>